my grandmother played with me on the floor with blocks when I was eight years old in Canada. And she got cuttings from the, for her wood stove from the shop. So they were like bandsaw and jigsaw cuttings and they were odd shapes. And we used to play, make fantasy cities. Grandmother, you know, so it was like a license from an adult to play, creative play. Anyway, when I, I, I didn't remember that until I was struggling and struggling with what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I was a truck driver in LA going to City College and I tried radio announcing, which I wasn't very good at. I tried chemical engineering, which I wasn't very good at, didn't like. And then I remembered, you know, somehow I just started racking my brain about what what do I like? What did, where was I? Where, what, what made me excited? And I remembered art, that I love going to museums, and I love looking at paintings. I love listening to music. Those things came from my mother, who took me to concerts and museums. And I uh, remembered Grandma on the blocks. Just on a hunch, I tried uh, architecture. Tried some architecture classes, and at first I didn't do great. In fact, I flunked the first class in perspective drawing, and it really got me angry. So I went back in the next semester and took it and got an A. And then I had a architecture drafting class, which the teacher and I got along real well. He was an architect. At the same time, I was taking classes at uh, USC, summer classes in ceramics. And art, and art drawing, design, art design. And the ceramics teacher, Glenn Lukens at the time, was having a house designed by Rafael Soriano. And Glenn somehow looked at me and said, I just have a, another hunch. He said, I'd like you to meet Soriano. And uh, I did, and I watched how Soriano guy with a black suit and a black tie and a beret, you know, I mean, it was real, <laughs> really funny guy. And uh, he, but there was something about it that got, excited me. Maybe the drama of it, maybe the, the theater of it. And he knew what he was doing. He was in the, in the he was very Miesian. He did very stark things and that all excited me. And and uh, based on Glenn's recommendation, I took a class at night in architectural design, and I did really well. And I, I was skipped into second year. I couldn't afford it, but, uh, and they didn't have scholarships for architects, but somehow we, I worked and got through. Um, and once I got in it, I was off to the races, except in the first half of second year, my teacher came in, called me in and said, this isn't for you, you're not going to make it. And somehow I worked through that. And that guy works at the airport. <laughs> I see him every once in a while, <laughs> the teacher, but... Uh, and he, he, he acknowledges his mistake, of course, but it's... Uh, I mean, I just sort of kept going. It was dogged persistence once I got into it. What got me excited in the beginning was the social issues. I'm, I come from a very lefty, liberal family, Canada. And architecture looked like it was the panacea. You know, you could make housing for the poor and make wonderful cities and blah, blah, blah. City planning and the future and so on. That was the initial turn on, and all the way through, that lasted me all the way through school, actually. Um, when I got out of school and started to hit, I hit the brick wall that you can't do any of that. There, it doesn't exist. You can't do it. There's no clients for social housing in America. There's no, no program, no nothing. City planning, forget it. I mean, it's a kind of bureaucratic nonsense. It has nothing to do with ideas, it only has to do with real estate and stuff, and politics. So, 
Uh, and I used to say, I don't want to do houses for rich people. I always said that through school. I'm just not going to do that. Um, but I started to find some excitement in in the forms, the, the spaces, the being able to conceive of something and then see it built. And um, the process of building, the working with the craftsman, or lack of craftsmen is more likely, but trying to, to it's, a, it's a, an energy and it's a, it's a mind game too. It's trying to get these people motivated and, and uh, I guess it's like directing a movie, it's similar. Except there's legal implications times jillions. But um, it's a it's a really exciting when you get to the level I'm at now, where I have a lot of freedom. I don't get a lot of projects, but I get enough. And when I do get them, I usually people want what I'm doing, and and egg me on to explore things, and that's exciting. And then the social thing comes out the back door. At the end, you find, you realize you're, uh, you, I mean, you get some power because of the work to then address the social issues, not in a global sense, but in your own, in your own environment, your own immediacy. And so that's gratifying. It did come. That, that you do get a little bit of, power to say things and do things. Up until the point where I, I did my house, which is in the late 70s, most of the work, up until that point, I think, I thought of myself as an architect, uh, as a service business, as a you know, I did. I was working on Santa Monica Place, and uh, but I hadn't had much freedom to to really do things. And for the first time, even though it wasn't a lot of money, we only had like a budget of forty, fifty thousand um, dollars. I was able to do what I want, exactly what I want, and, and explore and play and do things. And I realized that I couldn't go back after that. <laughs> and my office changed at that point. The clients that we were working with all uh, left. The house finished it. One of the major clients said to me, the first Santa Monica place said, if you like this, he was sitting in my living room. He said, if you like this, then you don't like that. He was pointing to Santa Monica. And I said, yeah, you're right. And we shook hands and decided not to work together anymore. We never have. That was the Rouse Company in Maryland. They're, I liked them too, but it was not, it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, my house was, was strange. I mean, some of the things I did, like the chain link fence, it wasn't about, uh, what people thought it was about. The chain link fence was, uh, so much of that material is made and used, absorbed by the culture, and there's so much denial about it. I was fascinated by the denial. And I was trying to make it, humanize it, so if you're gonna use it, at least use it, find some way to use it right, or, or aesthetically more pleasing. Well, that backfired on me. Everybody thought I was making some kind of great, uh, sticking in the ribs kind of thing about. Um, also, the house was me trying to find my middle-class self in a middle-class neighborhood. How do I relate to this? I guess I, you know, I'm here, I'm with them. They have their cars on the front lawn, they have chain link, they have corrugated metal, they have all these things. How am I going to, I, you know, so I, I dealt with it. But when I dealt with it, it was like, 
the neighbors thought I was making fun of them, which I wasn't. Well, I bought an old house and I put a new house around it. I, I got interested in the dialogue between the old and the new and trying to, to sculpturally create a new entity but that retained the qualities of the new as independent and of the old. Uh, I set myself goals like that when I started. So I, I and I, I kind of pulled it off with the fur. I, I also wanted it to be seamless, that you couldn't tell where it began, where it stopped. And that was very successful, and that was the power of it. Uh, in fact, critics would come in and say, would look at a rain spot on the plaster and say, is that on purpose or not? And they thought they were maligning me, and I thought that was just one, that's exactly what I wanted them to worry about. Um, but recently, I had to remodel it again because my kids are growing up, and we needed to, so 10 years later, and I couldn't be me as I was then, and I couldn't tear the house down and start over again, which is artistically would have been the right thing to do. I couldn't sell it because it wasn't saleable. So I had to fix it. And once you did, it was like unraveling the sweater because what you see now, if you go there now, you, you, it's not seamless. You now see the old house and you see the new house. And I couldn't hang on to it. And I realized I was losing it. In fact, I had a dream. Um, I, w I was hanging on to some parts of what I did in 78 for dear life. And I realized I was, they weren't work, with the new stuff, they weren't working. Some of this I play, because it was my house, I played out as we went. I don't often, I don't do that often, but in this case, I did some of that. And um, I had a nightmare that a helicopter crashed into a Zeppelin <laughs> and the helicopter had a woman in a pink dress and my house is pink, pink outside, flat against the hell and she came crashing down on me in the street and I pulled my mother to safety and I realized when I woke up it was about my house that I was losing it and that uh, it, it made me resolve that I would, could go forward somehow. I don't know why, but it's kind of mystical. But I did, I cut, I cut out all the stuff that I was hanging on to, and after that I slept, it was wonderful. So some, something, something was going on. It was a panic of losing something that I'd really worked on. And now it's becoming something else, but it, it's not as good as it was. It's not, it's not, I know it isn't yet. It will be, I hope. The nice thing is you can just pick a piece off and throw it away if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had made some chairs uh, earlier and uh, they were shown at Bloomingdale's. I made them out of paper and they achieved some kind of commercial success and it scared me and so I stopped them because I wasn't ready to be a furniture, a successful furniture designer. I still wanted to be an architect and somehow I thought that was gonna end my life. So I stopped them and I started making chairs that I thought nobody would like and that's what these are. There is a range of, of uh, creativity possible, and I think it behooves us to, to explore that envelope and, and push at it. And uh, it comes out of an intuition, or a, a, a learned intuition, I guess. You, you study a long time till you can, can do it, but uh, it's from looking around you, it's from understanding what's happening in the culture, what's happening in the world. Uh, it's a really big picture because 
uh, there are no real rules. If you, if you look at the world around us and you think of all these adult and, and intelligent people who have gathered together over the years to create the biggest mess, it always looks like that. Where, wherever, whatever period. It looked like that when I was a kid. It looks like that now. And yet, somehow, we muddle forward and, and make things. So out of that comes inspiration, believe it or not, uh, and leads to ideas. For instance, I've been interested in the sense of movement in architecture. Well, who cares whether a building looks like it's moving or not? And I, maybe they shouldn't, but that's something that interested me. Maybe it comes from the fast society, the fast world around me that I'm trying to make some kind of connection to. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's a lot of, you just got to keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, and, and, and understand what's going on, and then play with it, and move with it, and make your, uh, your, your expression from that, grow from that. I don't think it does. I, I think the it's wide open. There's, uh, you curtail your own imagination if you do it. Uh, certainly, budgets and uh, politics and uh, uh, sites and all kind. There are constraints. Gravity is a constraint. Finally, um, but those are to any artist, manageable. Every artist confronts a series of issues that are constraints. Those constraints are then turned by the artist into a positive uh, uh, force to make something, make their mud pie, whatever it is. And uh, I think we learn to, to, to do that. So I don't, I think we make it, a, I mean, when, I had a house recently with no constraints, and I was, I had a, a horrible time with it. Uh, took, I, I, I had to look in the mirror a lot. Who am I? Why am I doing this? What, what is this all about? What is the social relevance of this? There was none. Uh, I couldn't, uh, and finally the owner gave me a quote from Oscar Wilde, which I, that it didn't, I can't remember the quote, but it was, in essence, that everything didn't have to be relevant. You could make a folly, and that there was some value in that. And then I, I lived on that for a while and made the so-called folly, which he's not going to build anyway. But um, I don't. I think we turn those constraints into uh, action. They wouldn't get built if they didn't respond to the programs. And in this case, it's a museum in Bilbao, Spain, uh, for the Guggenheim uh, of New York. Uh, this one is in uh, Toledo, Ohio. It's an art school. All of these buildings uh, have very strict functional programs that have to be honored and met and explored. Uh, I. I look at these programs and, and uh, many times question them and, and try to present the clients with opportunities they haven't thought of, uh, and that involves them in the, uh, in the process. So at the end, a building is uh, a, a product of working with the client. This is in Czechoslovakia, Prague, on the beautiful river. It's adjacent to 19th century facades in plaster. And unfortunately, this doesn't show context. But the building is nearly completed. And it blends, even though it is of its, has its own body language, it, it uh, fits very well into the form of the city. Uh, I think the f function is like the budget. You have to respect it, honor it, and deal with it. And if you disagree with it, don't do it. I'm very concerned with that issue today in uh, Seoul, Korea. I'm doing a museum on a very tight urban site surrounded by uh, half a dozen of the worst 
uh, high-rise towers I've ever seen, uh, the worst copies of American um, uh, commercial architecture. Uh, but on the diagonals, uh, the, the site looks at the mountains and looks at some shrines and temples. And one of the shrines, Shang Mio, which I'd never heard of, is one of the, it's got to be at least in the top 10 building ever built on this earth, and not many people know about it. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, building, and it's within view of my site, just like these other. Uh, the inspiration, how do you fit in? How do you fit in contextually? How do you make a building? Uh, and this is something I believe, even though the, the buildings the bad buildings are there, they're, they're built, they're there uh, by human beings, and uh, there has to be a certain uh, accommodation to them, uh, not to ignore them, you can't ignore them. And uh, how do you, so this is a, a kind of an American image transplanted, and yet there's the, the, this landscape and these beautiful shrines. Um, and how to make these connections. And sitting right next to my site is a palace, a one-story Korean uh, palace, and uh, a 19th century uh, two-story building. That's not very good, but it's a, it's a protected building. All of these elements will, uh, I'm trying to gather them into my head and use them in some way. And then this building is a museum. It has a function. Uh, it has galleries and will show international art, so it's, it's an international, um, uh, has an international requirement. Uh, and then you get into all the requirements of showing art and galleries and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, but the, in the end, I think the historic uh, uh, elements of the culture, the, the strengths of Korea, which uh, at this point I think have to do with gardens and landscapes because most of their buildings were torn down by invaders over the years. Uh, and how to recapture and how to understand culturally, how to, how to understand the, the needs of this uh, community that needs to find a pride in, in art again because it was de destroyed for them. And they're trying to search for that. And so this, I'm looking at all of those things for this building. Now, will I succeed? I don't know. But uh, I have to be interpretive. I have to bring all of those elements in, the history, the current, the present, the chaos. I hate all the computer images that I've been confronted with from the beginning until today. Uh, however, since I've gotten involved with buildings that have shape to them, uh, that uh, are very difficult to describe to a contractor, to a builder. I've made a, a relationship by some circuitous route through IBM to um, the people in France that make the Mirage airplane, Dassault. And they have a software or a program, Katia, that for making airplanes that allowed us to uh, Ex describe steel structures and uh, curved structures in a way that uh, demystified them for the builder so that they weren't afraid and didn't add uh, superimpose uh, fear costs on, on the project. Mm -hmm. And we've been very successful in that. And it, I think it, it's uh, turned the tide, in other words, the most architects and contractors are in mortal battle from the day they start. Uh, the contractor is scared of the uh, costs and, their, and losing money, and the architect is pushing to get his or her dream to, the, to fruition. And they're in conflict. And this, uh, I found through this funny gadget that uh, the architect can become the master builder can become the leader, can uh, direct 
the project and can, and the contractor likes it. They, li they would rather be the, the child in the equation than the parent. And they'd rather have the conceiver uh, take a parental role. So it, it's through this uh, technology that I've found in the few projects now that it's, it's been very uh, possible to uh, change that, that relationship in a positive way for everybody. I did, in the course of, of working with it, get into trying to design on it, even though I hate the imagery. And it was, I likened it to like uh, putting my hand in the fire and seeing how long you could keep it in there before I pulled it out. So I would sit at the thing, it took about three minutes or four minutes before the fire got too hot and I'd pull it out. <laughs> uh, but in that, pro I, did, I did design a form that I'd never had before. It looks like a prehistoric uh, 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 horse's skeleton, head skeleton. So maybe I'm getting into Deborah's area. But uh, it was interesting. I think it is possible. I think it's just a training thing. And, and uh, if you're aware that, you know, that you're putting your hand in the fire for a few minutes. I hang on to democracy, sort of, uh, even though it's not perfectly practiced, uh, that uh, this has changed the game a lot. And, and you see a lot of architects, uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of being more accepted. They're more uh, all-star architects today than there were when I was a kid. There are many different uh, uh, s kinds of work, uh, signatures in work, and uh, we do coexist. I, I like Bob Stern's work uh, a lot. Uh, but, and so we can be different, we can coexist, and it is a, uh, we're finding a way to, to make, we're going to have to find ways to make cities that express that. They can't be uh, the historical uh, idyllic uh, 19th century model anymore because we're not living like that anymore and our world isn't like that and we're, we're finding ways to to move forward while learning from the past I don't you don't you don't uh, ignore it you don't just dis, dis, uh, destroy it but you build from it but I think pluralism is the most optimistic uh, that that there is now many ideas many possibilities, and then how do you bring that together into a new city form? You just do your work, and if somebody likes it, you like it, and if they don't, you don't try and sell them on it. Uh, I think that most of the world wants to live in the past. And I think it's, I mean, I think it's going to catch up with us at some point. Um, and I don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe it's my fantasy. Maybe I want it to happen because I'm tired of it. I think we should, we should start living in the present and trying to deal with it. It seems like it would be much more positive. Um, but architecture... I think we, the blurring of the lines between art and architecture and has, has got to happen. I don't think it, these categories are working very well. Uh, I'm finding the crossover much more exhilarating, much more interesting. And the collaboration uh, much more interesting. In architecture, you can't build I don't think you can build Rockefeller Center today. It represents a different politic, a different ethic, a different idea. I think that, uh, that, our, that our politics suggest that um, many ideas can coexist, and the richness of ideas coexisting interests me. 
and I've it's led me to collaborating with other architects, with other artists, and I find that exhilarating and um, very fruitful. Very, very uh, things happen. I just collaborated with Philip Johnson and Oldenburg and his wife and uh, Richard Serra and Larry Bell. It's very painful when these things happen, but when you do houses, you're dealing with emotion at some kind of high pitch. You know? So I never expect much, but this one got pretty good, where it was like a chess game. Philip would, had the guess, I had the biggest piece of it. It was my project. I brought them all in. And Philip got a little guest house. And he made his move on the guest house, and then I would play against him. It was like a chess game, and he's so brilliant, this guy, that he would, he could preempt my trajectory. He'd get me just before I made the move and do it. <laughs> And uh, then Klaus had done stuff before that had seeped into my head through the binoculars and, and stuff like that. So the, some of the shapes, after the fact, I could recognize were coming from way back somewhere in that relationship. And those shapes turned on Richard Serra to do a new kind of piece which came out of the house. So there was this play happening. And when you see the whole package, you can see the energy. It's not, uh, I mean, if it was built, it would be really clear. I don't know how clear it is, but we all can feel it. We can see it. And we, that's kept us going. And that's pretty exciting. That's really taking the best guys you can people you can get, and, and upping the ante a lot. I think uh, there are all kinds of architects. So one of the problems, the schools create architects supposedly like people like me. That's the whole thrust. And not many people can do it, not many people. So there's all kinds of, and I think the educational thing has to change a bit so that you allow different kinds of architects to evolve. Because when you get in practice, you need all these different skills. It's, it's, it's not something you can do yourself. So I think that having an open mind about the kind of collaboration with people is important. If you're the Lone Ranger, it's a little, a little bit harder, I think. Um, I think that the iconoclast that you suggest, the fountainhead. It's hard to exist in, in a, in a, in the context of our, polit our politics now, and our world. Uh, there are a few people that try it and get away with it. But um, I don't, I don't see them the people who do it, I don't see them producing what the guys who used to do it did. So it's not, I mean, it's a pose then. It's not real. I think you have to be a collaborator on lots of levels. You have to be willing to be a leader in the collaboration. But you, know, um, uh, you have to be able to work with the clients and, and uh, inspire them to more than they, I mean, usually by, when they come to me, they're ready for, they want to do something special. And, uh, even the Disney Hall thing, they, they really wanted, they gave, they carved out a real free path for me. Uh, and even today with all the troubles, they're not really hitting at the, at the, design as the fall, the flaw. So it was, I guess at a certain, uh, you know, I'm 66, so you get to a point where you, you get some powers and some credibility. It took a long time. With certain people, it's not with everybody. The U.S. government won't hire me. They, they laugh. 
patience, yeah. Mm. But hanging on, being relentless, you know, just never giving up. I guess that's patience. And having a vision, I mean, you got to know where you want to go with it. You got to know what you're... And how to explain it. I used to think that the uh, explanation robbed the essence out of the thing. It was sort of, I didn't want to take that. I mean, there is a, a feeling of that in, in the art world or in architecture. But I, I discovered that the more I could explain myself, the better it was in terms of the relationship with the other people. And that uh, even though, even when it became very intuitive and I didn't know exactly where I was going, I could, I could analyze it for somebody and, ex and tell them what I thought I was doing and why I thought I was doing that and how it fit into the history of my work. So I think, it, in my case, I find the clients very important to the equation. I think there are a lot of ways to be an architect, and uh, math is certainly an important part of it, but uh, there are a lot of different areas uh, in architecture, and it, the schools have a tendency to develop an architect uh, trying to make the, the uh, stars, but uh, all of us need a lot of help from a lot of different kinds of people, so I think First of all, you have to love architecture. If you love it more than anything and you want to be part of it, then you find your particular uh, niche or your way of dealing with it. And it may not be the same way I deal with it. It may be uh, uh, the working with uh, research into uh, uh, planning and housing, and it may develop into the uh, uh, materials research, it may be in graphics uh, as it applies to architecture, it may be in um, the, re the uh, presentation of architecture. There are, there are so many parts I can't enumerate, but um, I think it, it's a broader field. A nine-year-old uh, kid came to my office the other day. He was doing a paper for his class on architecture, and he said, how do you know <clears throat> how do you know when you want to be something like an architect? How, do I, how will I know? And I said, what's your favorite thing? This just popped out of me. What is your favorite thing that you do? And he said, well, I love the sleepovers at my house when I can stay up late with my friends. And I said, okay, when you love architecture as m more than that, then you'll know it's the right thing. <laughs> just... It's an awesome uh, uh, thing to, to come out and, and look for a way to make a living and to f get into the world. Uh, and it looks awesome and it's huge and some of us do things now that make us look so smart and, and uh, like we've conquered it. But it, uh, it just takes uh, baby steps. You start a little bit at a time and it grows and you can do it and we're just normal human beings, and, and we did it, so you can do it. It's the same as the Canadian dream, I think. Uh, <laughs> the American dream is about freedom, free expression, um, melting pot ideas, exchange of ideas, That's my American dream. Uh, it's very naive, I think. <laughs> but I hang on to it. Uh, I'm scared of the guns and stuff that's going on. And if you look at my career, I'm realizing an, an American dream. I'm having a great time. I'm certainly appreciated by enough people to make, make it worth feel good, um, and I'm getting to act out a certain uh, game, or whatever you want to call it, but 
And I think it is contributing something to the world. No, where, how important it is, I don't know. I don't have any uh, illusions or, or visions of grandeur about it or sense of that. 